Come on in. Here we go. Let's have a look. Hey, this is beautiful. This is a real old station, and we're going to see a real old steam train. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. Now, look, there's going to be a train along in a minute. Yeah. You could go for a wander, go wherever you like. All I ask is do not go over the edge. Got that? Yes, Jeremy? All right, off you go. I'll see you later. I think it was Alfred Hitchcock who once advised people never to work with animals or children. But there were no camcorders in his day. Now that there are, recording a family day out is one of the most popular uses for a camcorder. And to make a good video needs a mixture of planning and spontaneity. By planning, I mean you want to decide in advance the basic structure of the video. And I've decided to make a chronological record focusing on a few key events. We've got to the station. I think I know what the next shot is going to be. Now we're starting on a railway, then we're going to a fun fair, and then we're going to a wildlife park. And as this is the next item, this is the next shot I'm going to get. The train arriving, here it comes. Give him a wave, that's it, lovely. Wait till it stops. OK, on you get. You get on and shut the door behind you, and then I'll get on the train afterwards, all right? Off you go. Shut the door. A very important thing to remember is that you don't have to video everything. I mean, for a start, a long video is often a boring one. And secondly, it can get very tedious for the family if you're constantly using the camcorder rather than enjoying the day out with them. A video of a family day out should be a record of the event and not become the event in itself. There's some shots of the children anyway. What can you see? It's the river over here. Oh, right. Just look at the river. Now, listen, that's, that, that's actually sparked up a very good idea, but it's something that's very useful you'd use. It's called a suggestive shot. If somebody says, Naomi said, oh, look at the river, well, get to her position and get what's called a point of view shot, a POV shot of the river as it goes past. In other words, from Naomi's, excuse me, bunking up so close alongside you, but I want to get a picture of what you saw from your point of view. Here it is. children let's go quickly off you go over there come with me let's get the door shut well we've arrived at the fun fair our first destination today I want to get some shots of the children on the ferris wheel plus one or two other sequences right, then, look, I'm going to give you some money off you go don't have fun on the ferris wheel first I'll catch up in a minute and so far in this series, we've looked at the basics of video making grammar. In the next two programmes, we're going to look at some advanced techniques, ideas that will give your videos a more professional feel. Let's start with picture composition. This is a perfectly standard establishing shot of the big wheel, but it looks a bit flat, and that's because television screens are two dimensional. The trick is to choose a shot which gives an impression of depth. Now I've come closer to the wheel and at more of an angle, and you'll see it's altogether a much more interesting shot. Straight away, there's a feeling of depth and drama. Strangely enough, often the best way to get uh, cutaway shots is not to move the camera around, but to hold the camera still and let the movement do the moving. In other words, not to zoom around and pan around when we're in this situation, but just to hold the camera absolutely still, which is what I'm going to do now, and we'll see. I think that's probably about enough of that for one day. Let's go and see what else we can shoot. Obviously, I'm going to get lots of shots of the rides at this fair, but one of the really nice ways of getting uh, the effect of the ride is to get the reaction shots. Remember, we dealt with reaction shots in the last program, and there's nothing more effective than showing the children enjoying the ride on the ride itself. Let's see what we get.
Now, I don't know if you find this shot slightly uncomfortable to watch. It wouldn't surprise me if you did, all right? Just straighten it up now, Scott. Thank you very much. It goes against all Scott's professional training doing that kind of shot. What we weren't doing there was allowing walking space, because what you want to do is a little bit like the thing we did in an earlier program in this series, looking space, exactly the same sort of logic applies. If you can, let the camera anticipate where the person's walking like that. I'm walking this way, then the camera should get a feeling of where I'm going to end up rather than where I've just been. You can see it's a much more comfortable feeling, isn't it? And we can illustrate the effect of this really well with the sequence that we've done for you. Some of the shots are good, some of them are bad. Children are very good all the way through, naturally, but I think you'll see the difference quite clearly. This time, you can see what the children are up to, and you get a much better feeling for what's going on. Now, this is a really good place to demonstrate some of the things we've looked at so far. It's a can stall. In some places, it's a coconut shy. It's the same thing. Now, what we want to get here is the scene, the whole scene of what's going on. We want to see whether they get the cans off the shelf or not, and we want to see the children's reaction when they hit or miss. Now, one way of doing it, I suppose, would be to try to cover the whole action, like this. Just take your time, hit them nice and hard, on the top, they'll go off. That's it. Oh, one more. You're on that set there, not quite what we wanted, and it makes you appreciate how skillful the cameramen are who film golf tournaments, filming a tiny ball crossing a usually grey sky. Believe me, it's an awful lot more difficult than it looks. If you watch any sports event on television, you'll know that the broadcasters use anything between four and ten cameras. And if they were filming a can stall like this, they'd probably film the entire sequence three or four times, setting the camera up in different places each time. This picture shows what I mean. Position one gets the close-up reaction shots. Position two, close-up shots of their target. Position three, a wide shot. And position four gets an over-the-shoulder shot. Now, I've only got one camera, and I don't want to waste time filming that sequence four times. It's supposed to be a fun day out, after all. You don't want to pay for lots of ghosts anyway. So the only way to capture something like this is to do it in stages and edit it together, either in the camera or at home. Have a look at this sequence and watch out for the name of each shot I use. You see what I mean about a reaction shot of Fiona's face? Seeing her expression when she hit the can was much more interesting than seeing the can being knocked off. It will bring back much more vivid memories, which is really the point, isn't it? By shooting it in stages and editing them together, you're making it look as if there were more than one camera. It's a commonly used trick, particularly in interviews. We'll get on to that in the next programme. Let's get some more shots. Time you switch the camcorder on to record a subject, you have to make a number of important decisions. And the first is shot size. Shot size refers to how much of the frame is filled by the main subject. Now, although humans aren't always a subject of your shot, shot sizes are normally related to human proportions. The three main shots are known as the long shot, the mid shot, and the close up. This is a long shot because, in human terms, it contains the entire body and some space around it. The long shot does for humans what the establishing shot does for places. It introduces us to the subject before we move in for a closer look. Long shots are used less frequently than closer shots because you feel less involved in the action. If we shoot two children playing and stay far enough away to include all of their bodies, the viewer can feel left out. But if you get closer, the shot's more interesting. This is a mid shot. It usually goes from a few inches above the waist to a few inches above the head, like this. It's 
one of the most popular shots for recording people because you can capture the broad gestures and facial expressions as well. Try not to amputate your subject of the limbs like this. Thank you, Scott. And watch out for things that appear to be growing out of your subject's head, like this pole behind me. Not very dignified. And this is a close-up, which allows you to see small details. As a rule, the closer you get to a subject, the more involved you get with it. The trick is to vary your shot sizes. Have a look at this sequence. Here we have a long shot of the children buying candy floss. It establishes where they are and what they're doing. The mid-shot lets us see them being given the candy floss, as well as their reactions. And a close-up is a bit more intimate. And finally, another long shot to remind us where we were before moving on to the next location. OK, you go on in, I'll catch you up. I won't. I mentioned children and animals at the beginning of this programme, but this butterfly farm is a great place to demonstrate really close-up shots and some nice reaction shots as well. Now, obviously, butterflies aren't going to be bribed into doing things like a pet dog might be with a few dog biscuits, but I'm sure if I'm patient, I'll get some acceptable pictures of the wildlife and the children too, I hope. Now then, listen, you wander off, see what you can find. If you find something really interesting, let me know. I'm going to take some pictures of some butterflies. So all stay together. That's the only one I want to say to you. Have fun. Now, when you're filming small animals, like insects, for example, it's a perfect opportunity of using what most cameras have, which is a macro setting. On this one, all you have to do is just widen the lens to its widest on the zoom, and then it automatically focuses, and you can get things really close up. OK, yes, I'll come with you. Okay. Let's have a look. Oh, yeah, got a huge... Look at that one. I wonder if I can get that huge one. There's only one slight drawback about using the macro setting, and that's that the depth of field is very small. That's to say, you've only got a small amount in focus, and anything closer will be out of focus, anything further away will be out of focus. And for that reason, any movement of the camera will upset that, obviously. So for that reason, one tends to use a tripod to give it an absolutely steady base. But it also gives you the opportunity of getting a really nice effect if you want to focus on a leaf and then refocus to get onto the butterfly that's sitting on the leaf, then you can press the override button and actually focus manually, and that will produce a really nice effect. This is what the pros call a pull focus shot. It draws your eye from one subject to another simply by refocusing the camera. Probably just as well we aren't as close to the lions as we were to the butterflies, but this tower does give us a terrific view of the wildlife park and the surrounding countryside. It's a great place for an establishing shot. But have a look at this shot of the lions. The problem with those shots of the lions was that they were a bit flat, and that's what can happen if you look down on a subject. And in fact, your camera position, whether you're looking down or up, does have a quite a, a big impact on how you perceive the pictures. If you look down on them, it can diminish the subject. And if you look up at a subject, it can make them look more powerful. These shots of the tarantula make the point well. From above, it looks relatively harmless, but from below, it looks terrifying. Similarly, looking at people from below could make them look frightening and dominating, powerful. On the other hand, looking down on someone can make them look timid and dominated. Angles like that are obviously deliberately chosen for the effect they produce, but shot heights are terribly important. In general terms, the thing to aim for is to get the camera more or less on a level with the subject you're taking. I'm going to take some pictures of these tigers now, and I'm going to lower the camera to get more or less on the same height as their eyes and their head.
Something to look out for is this wire netting, because like water or glass, it can really confuse the autofocus mechanism inside the camera. It doesn't know whether to focus on the wire or the background. Have a look. You see what I mean? Now, most cameras have a manual override. This one has. Just press it, and uh, then you can focus manually on what you want to. There you are. Of course, one way of dealing with the wire netting problem is to come around on this side of the tiger's enclosure. Then you don't have any problems at all with focus. In fact, you get a great view. I really like that shot of that tiger up there. Now, we said in an earlier program that you should plan through your video shoot. And in a place like this, in a zoo or a safari park, it's an absolutely ideal opportunity to plan because you know in advance when's feeding time, when's bath time and so on. And what we've done is plan a sequence in advance and shoot it. And this was the result. Now, I said earlier, it's always worth trying to get on your subject's level point of view. And here's a classic example. I could take this picture from up here and make a very nice wide shot, sort of establishing shot. We've got Naomi with her snake and Fiona with a tarantula and Jeremy feeding the chickens. But you can see it's a bit sort of dull. It doesn't have very much impact, does it? Now, the trick is to get down onto their level and get into close-ups as well. And you'll see what a huge difference that makes. Ah, Naomi, beautiful snake. Oh, she's beautiful. Mm. What's it feel like? Well, the legs are really tickly, but her body's really heavy. And she, like, drags her tail. A good time to get candid, natural shots of children is when they're concentrating on something else, like food or opening presents or something. If you find they start showing off to the camera, just pretend to record it all and they'll soon get tired of it. On the other hand, if they do become very self-conscious, another trick is to try filming from a little distance away using the zoom lens. You can even shoot from the hip, literally holding the camera by your side and pretending it isn't on. We had a brilliant holiday. Remember? Oh, we may be going to Germany. In the end of July. And then we saw those otters and they were terribly smelly. Right? <gasps> they were really and good and funny underwater. And there goes the engine. Engine. That's the engine. That's the one you saw, isn't it? We went well, inside GWR there, didn't we? On the edge. We went inside there and it was really hot, like the butterfly plane, isn't it? Really, really hot. So we went out and I got covered in soot. Taking the carriage. Mm. Taking. You joining on? Okay, stop the swinging for a minute, children. I want to say something to all three of you. First of all, I want to say thank you very much for a lovely day. You've really been a lot of fun, and it's been absolutely smashing. And I want a special word with you, young man. Come here, Jeremy. Come here, you. And it was your birthday recently, wasn't it? When well, I got a special present for you. There you are. Thank you. And happy birthday, and thank you very much for being such good fun today. Okay. Happy birthday, Mary. Thank you. Oh, cards from the girls as well, eh? What have you got? Open it up. Let's have a look. Go on, pull it off. That's it. Don't worry about the ribbon. Just wrench it off. That's the way. Rip the paper off. Come on. You can read it for him, can't you, Naomi? Jeremy, happy birthday. Love mummy and daddy. Look it off. Oops, now I've got a little there. Put the hair What's it going to be? Lego. Hey. Lego. Yeah. What do you think, Jeremy? We looked at basic editing equipment in an earlier program. If you want to be more ambitious and have special effects, you need a vision mixer like this. 
it can do many of the things that professional equipment can do and it works by taking two shots one from the VCR and one from the camera and literally mixing them in a variety of ways onto a second VCR. Have a look at some of the effects. The temptation with effects like that is to overuse them, which completely negates the point. Special effects should, after all, be special. What's more, you don't necessarily need fancy equipment to get good effects. With a little imagination, you can create your own. Television programs nearly always start with an opening title sequence, which is meant to catch your attention and tell you a little about the program. Most camcorders have a basic titling facility, which lets you superimpose titles on your video. But home videos can be made a lot more interesting with proper made opening titles. Here are one or two, as the saying goes, I prepared earlier. In the next programme, I'll be making a promotional documentary, which is obviously much more formal than a record of a family day out and requires very different techniques. And we'll show you how to shoot an interview, how to film on the move, and we'll go over again some of the main points we've covered in the series. We'll end this programme with the edited highlights of today's video. And watch out for all the different types of shot. Goodbye. Shut the door behind you.